Today, Chuck and Brock talk about mental representation, Chapter 25, by Professor Claude Panaccio, from the Cambridge History of Medieval Philosophy. This is Generous Theology. No, I think you have. And in fact, we've got some things to go on mental representation, but I think you have moved the ball forward even to where I think the next chapter is going to take us, which is, which has to do with certainty. And what is truth? How do, how can we become certain of things? And in, in an essentialist system, there, there are ways to measure fact in a way that I think we can understand. It tends to be based on the senses. You can experiment, you can test it. And I think that's why among especially the hard sciences, I think there is a sense in which essentialism still holds some sway for those people. And people who are very much empiricist will think that way and are often looked even where there are questions of mental representation and the truth of mental representations, they're often looking for a scientific explanation, something that can be tested, experimented hypothesis, test them and create a theory out of. It is a little harder, I think, although not impossible, to come up with a truth test, shall we say, in an existentialist mode. Now, I think there are ways of doing it, but they tend to have some problems. But so to use your to use your bank or your, your money idea, I think most of the world would say if the bank perceives you to have five eight hundred and eighteen dollars because that's what the records show and and the records can be verified in some particular way, and while well, you perceive yourself to have five hundred and eighteen million dollars, at some point your perception what is your perception based and is the perception a willful are you actually taking a falsehood and trying to persuade people of it, or have you self-deluded yourself? Those kinds of questions end up occurring. And But at some point you can have, people can be self-deluded. And one of the things I was thinking about, even as we were going through this discussion, my wife and I were, were just having a discussion a little bit about the impact of Alzheimer's and other dementia. M- my father had a form of dementia, not Alzheimer's, uh, but it was brought on by a head injury in the last years of his life. And her stepfather is having some form of dementia as well that's in his body of life. And one of my one of my uh, really close friends here, his father-in-law had Alzheimer's, and as did his father for different periods of time, and it expressed itself in different ways. But in all four of those cases, least so with my father, I think, but there would be perceptions that these people had that had no basis in any kind of reality that we could perceive, and yet yet to them they became very much reality. And it's interesting to think about the impact of delusions and creating mental images you know, in a broken way. Now, I think you and I as Christians, and specifically as Reformed Christians, have some thoughts about this, have some ideas about how there is a created order and sin has broken into that created order and has brought some disorder into that. And so we see the these illusions that these people with these various mental illnesses, Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia have as, as being a, a break, a malformation perhaps of, of reality in, in their mind. But it, it's interesting also just even to think about how then might we deal with a person who has Alzheimer's and are there different ways to treat it and knowing that it's, an, at least for now, it is generally an un treatable as far as never gonna, you're never going to get better from it. Maybe you can mitigate some of the effects. What do you do in those circumstances? And, and I was also this week reading some people who would say, just let the people live in their delusion. Just accept the delusions as being their reality. And as I was thinking through that, on in some situations, that seems to be, you can understand why you might go there, right? Elderly person who believes that they're, to steal a little bit off of your image, who still believes that they're 20 five and thinks that they're in their house and not in a nursing home and thinks that you're just going to be able to leave and and you can keep them calm by just accepting that and yet there are also very destructive come from allowing people to live in that in that reality obviously we lock doors of, of Alzheimer's units for that reason but even the psychological impact have and that's one of the things we were talking about is some of the, the negative psychological impact these delusions had on loved ones on people close to the people with the delusions. And I know we're getting far beyond Aquinas and 
and Occam and, and those, but, but they are real everyday applications that I think probably have a great deal of impact in the way we think about even things like mental delusions and Alzheimer's and, and that kind of thing. And if we're going to accept full on is existentialism, that the self image is the correct image. What happens when you have that kind of a mental image, that mental dysfunction, which for the most part, people accept as being a, a mental dysfunction. But then at what point do we say that other other mental illnesses are or are not mental dysfunction? It's, it's just a really difficult, it's a difficult ramble in which to walk. And I feel often that there's a lot to learn there, but I also feel like that there's just so much there that I'm not sure I can ever make it through the bramble. There's so many branches jumping in the way and thorns sticking out that, that it's just a difficult thing, but definitely worthwhile thinking about. And with great application to the ever. I think it's worth considering maybe one of the turns to the natural that I think is a consequence of some of these medieval thoughts and some of these outworkings of some of these ideas. And so you have these ideas that ultimate pictures or narratives about reality uh, are in uh, conflict. And so, for example, the atheist has always been able to say to the theist, which God? You want to say to me that I should accept a theistic conception of reality, and yet, if I consider the school of Islam and their conception of reality versus Christianity versus Judaism, classical theism, you have this Greek culture from Alexander the Great to the end of antiquity and the narratives that came out of there. Then you have the Latin West, then you have the East in all of its various forms. And so we have this multiplicity of, <laughs> let me put it crassly, but hopefully humorously, Chuck, we're maybe all running the Kentucky Derby of reality. And there are lots of different horses in this race. And here, you and I, Chuck, not only would like to pick the quote-unquote winner in terms of which worldview is correct, but we'd also like to do it early enough in our lives where it makes sense. What could be worse than living one's life in one worldview only to find out at the very end of things that one was living a lie? And so that's why we talked about one of the premises uh, of today in this chapter being that truth and falsehood themselves are at stake when we're talking about mental representations. And who can bring a dog to the fight or a horse for the race without having to deal with these issues? And that's precisely, you mentioned earlier, our up and coming chapters here. The next chapter is science and certainty because it is the scientific method as well as historical method, the, the, the historical, theological, critical method that must be considered in this horse race about reality. And we have to deal with issues of science. We have to deal with issues of certainty. We have to distinguish about divine revelation. We have to talk about these things. And, and this is what the medievals were trying to, this is the Gordian knot that the medievals were trying to unravel. And I don't think I'm doing any better here. Now, I will say this much. It's been very important for me to represent the schools accurately here in this lineup. Having said that, it's there's some pretty clear natural alignments that probably we should talk about more and go into more because at the end of the day, Chuck, if I go in there to my bank and, and ask my banker to accept my mental representation of $518 million in my account, what's my answer to him when he said, funny you should say that because I have a mental representation of your account and it's zero. <laughs> I want to come down strong here and, and I don't even think the horse race is even close in, an, in important ways. But like you said, that doesn't mean that there aren't issues to be talked through and that there aren't threads to pull on and follow and go down the rabbit hole with. So we have a chance to do that, I think, coming up more. Let me just throw things over to you for the last thoughts for this particular session. Yeah, no, I think you've made an excellent point when you said that truth is really wrapped up in all. And I think even Christians, I think there are, as you're well aware, there are some differences even among Christians. Is how do we, even if we agree that ultimate truth is found in God, exactly how we get there is sometimes debated. And I know that you'll, there's been discussion even in the Reformed world about classical apologetics versus presuppositional apologetics. And those kinds of 
things really get at some of the ways that we deal with conclusions that we make on issues like the ones we've been dealing with on mental representation. And I understand, I tend to fall towards the presuppositionalist side of the continuum on these things. I also understand why there are some classical apologetic folks who would say, you just give it up. <laughs> You've just decided that there can't, there's no way to come up with truth other than through presuppositionalism. I, I think the case for presuppositionalism is greater than that, but, but I also see why people get there. And so even as Christians, we, so we struggle a little bit with how do we get to the conclusions that we get to and how do we deal with certainty and truth when we are dealing with our own self-perceptions of things and, and the fact that we're limited to either as humans, we're limited to our own self-perceptions or to perceptions that are given to us, that are revealed to us. As Christians, we'd say God reveals them to us, but even then we perceive them in a, in a certain way. And how do we deal with that? It, it's all really interesting and worthwhile questions that all come out of it. And for that reason, I'm going to circle right back to the very beginning and your comments about how important a chapter this is. I fully agree with you, and you, in reading this chapter, how, how so much of what we believe and so much of what we do day to day is really reliant on our answers to questions like the ones that are raised chapter. So this is not some kind of ivory tower discussion by highfalutin folks, regular day-to-day -day people like you and me who go off to our jobs and, and do our stuff and, and don't get to spend all of our time just thinking phil philosophically. And yet, Yet these kinds of questions impact us all of the time. And they, they impact the work I do as a lawyer. They impact the work you do with computers. It, 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 it impacts the work that a nurse does. It impacts the work that a pastor does. It impacts all sorts of things. And it's a, it's a, as sometimes I hear people do, the poo-poo philosophy is just ivory tower stuff. This chapter puts paid to that, by all means. This is important stuff. Amen. Thank you, my friend. What a pleasant conversation on an interesting and intense uh, and even sometimes controversial topic. <laughs>